He's also a best-selling author, The Zombie Survival Guide. <laughs> Complete protection from the living dead. The useful and dependable Zombie Survival Guide will help you in surviving against the hordes of undead who may be stalking you right now. This year, I've had the privilege of watching multiple human versus zombie battles from my office in Broad Center. And it is clear that you, our Pitzer students, practice the tenets of the top 10 lessons for a zombie attack. Two rules I will mention today. Number one, organize before they rise. Perfectly Pitzer. And seven, Get out of the car, get onto your bike. <laughs> the Zombie Survival Guide was ranked 12th in the December New York Times paperback bestseller list for a total of 21 weeks, and World War Z appeared on the New York Times hardcover bestseller list, peaking at number nine. Millions of copies of Max's books have been sold worldwide, and they have been published in 18 different languages. World War Z is currently being adapted for a major motion picture starring Brad Pitt. Please welcome Max Brooks to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, it's a little surreal being back after all this time. See so much has changed and so much hasn't. Professor Steve Glass, you remember me, right? <laughs> I remember you. First, first professor I ever had in the very first class in 1990. Still has that comb over. Now, I was looking, I didn't see uh, Lako Tongan anywhere. Um, yeah. Now, uh, Lako used to say to me whenever I'd get up to speak, he would say, Max, be brief. <laughs> so in honor to him, I'm going to be brief. Uh, to the parents, I, I look, at, I see all your faces, and I think, I know, did, they couldn't get someone better? All this money that we paid, and they got John Cryer from Two and a Half Men. <laughs> it's because of zombies, and, and I, I won't go into the game of humans versus zombies. I'll just, I'll, I'll be a little, I'll be brief, and it's called humans versus zombies, and there's humans and zombies, and they verse each other. And that's pretty much all you need to know. Now, as I understand the, um, the role that I'm supposed to perform today uh, is to inspire you and give you life lessons that you will then take out uh, into the world. No. No, and it's not because I don't have something to say. I mean, of course, I'm a writer. I, I have lots of things to say. But I don't know you guys. And I don't know the paths that you took to get here. And I don't know your lives. And I think that would be incredibly presumptuous and arrogant of me to just assume uh, that I have so much to teach you. Not to say that I'm not presumptuous and arrogant. Uh, I'm a New York Times bestselling author. It's in the, it's on my W-2. Uh, presumptuous, arrogant. Uh, but I don't know you guys. I know me. And I know what I had to go through. And I know what I learned. And the first thing I learned when I left here in 94 into my golden 20s, that my golden 20s sucked. <laughs> I'm sorry, they did. They were really hard. And, and nobody told me that. Nobody warned me. And at first I was like, is this some conspiracy of old people? Like, like no, get out there, kid. <laughs> it's going to be great. No, what, what I learned was that older people tend to glorify the past. And the older we get, the more glorifying our past gets. <laughs> My father is 85 years old. You ask him about what it was like to be in World War II, he'll tell you he had a ball. 
He'll say, ah, to be 19 and shot at. <laughs> so nobody taught me that it was going to be hard. And more importantly, nobody taught me that it was okay for it to be hard. It was supposed to be hard. That was the time in my life when I was taking my lumps and paying my dues and building my character. And there's somebody so much smarter than me once said or wrote, uh, adversity introduces us to ourselves. And I read that about six months ago. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> Would have been nice if I'd have read that in 94. <laughs> but it's true. Adversity introduces us to ourselves. And that's what I spent those years doing. I was figuring out who I was and what I wanted. And I couldn't have done that if I hadn't struggled and taken huge risks and failed spectacularly. And this is another thing nobody taught me. You know, we, we live in this society where we worship the winner, you know, duh, winning. Uh, <laughs> but nobody told me that even the biggest winners at some point in their lives had to be losers. And no matter how much success you have, you can't have success if you don't fail a little bit a few times. And I had to learn that from scratch. And I became the most successful failure that I know. <laughs> I know, I'm supposed to get up here and talk about my successes. Oh no, I'm talking about my failures. They were huge. You know, your generation likes to use the term epic fail. I coined that term. <laughs> Google epic fail. You'll see a picture of me at 27. <laughs> I got out of grad school and oh my God, I just spent so many years just, just struggling and just bashing my head up against constant rejection. And for me, it was doubly difficult because my parents are hugely successful and they never talked about their struggle years. So I just assumed it just came to them. And I was just assuming it was gonna come to me. I didn't understand what's wrong with me. And then I finally broke through. And I got, I'm not gonna say I got my first job because I'd been working. I was doing little jobs to pay my bills because I wasn't mooching off my parents. Hear that parents? <laughs> so I was doing whatever I could to pay my bills. And then I got my first big gig, Saturday Night Live. Yeah. And I was there for two seasons until they fired me. On my honeymoon. I don't even know how they found me. I was on an island in the middle of the Pacific. And to this day, I really do believe that Lorne Michaels laid a fiber optic cable from 30 Rock across the Pacific to Manihi just so I could get that one email that said, don't come back. Shuck it. But that was all right because I had my first book coming out, a zombie survival guide. Oh my God, zombie survival guide. The, all my life I wanted to be a published author. And, and here I was, oh my God, here it is. And it did turn out to be the most successful thing I've done in the book that would sort of define my career and change my whole life. But I didn't know that at the time because when it first came out, all I had were some really, really crappy reviews hugely, epically crappy reviews. And I'm not just talking about like little snarky bloggers who live in their mother's basement. <laughs> the LA Times ran a two-page spread <laughs> of my book and me and essentially argued that my parents should use birth control. Now, when my second book came out, World War Z, and I'm saying Canadians in the audience, World War Z, I'm sorry, we have to be ecumenical here. Uh, when, they, when they came out, I said, oh my God, well, I gotta get some copies under my arm, I gotta come back here, because this place was defined me, and, and I even wrote about it in World War Z. The whole big zombie battle takes place right here. And I took some books, and the first thing I did was I went to the ROTC office at CMC, because that's what I did my freshman year. <laughs> I was in Army ROTC during Desert Storm. I know, you're like, what? No, not because I was conservative, because I was liberal. Because I thought, well, America had been really good to me, and, and we're at war, and I gotta give back. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna give back. And I did, I gave back buckets of vomit. <laughs> I got up every morning, and I ran around, and I threw up all over CMC.
as I'm sure some of you have too. But then I thought, all right, I'm, I, I got to come back here. But it was fine. You know, even though I had did that and I blew up my knees and my back, to this day I can't run. Uh, but I had met some really awesome people and some career soldiers that became characters in World War Z. I probably couldn't have written that book if not for that experience. So it was great. And then I came back here. And look, I'm sorry, this thing keeps coming back. So, hey, I'm going to be me. Woohoo! Anyway. <laughs> I came back here. And I said, I got to meet some of my professors, the people who were so influential. And I met one, and it was so exciting. And I told them about these books I was being published. And then I told them about my secondary career, which sort of started, which is public speaking, which I'm sure you can't tell from this speech. Uh, <laughs> when Zombie Survival Guide first came out, and the reviews were so horrible, and I was so desperate. And I said, oh my god, I got to sell books anyway. I can't, oh my god. And I thought, what if I started doing zombie self-defense lectures? And I'll do it totally straight-laced, just like my book was. It'll be like, take back the night, except, you know, take back the night from zombies. And I was so scared, and my heart was just pounding. And I did my first lecture, and, oh my god, they liked it. They liked it so much, I kept getting gigs. And before I knew it, I had this whole other career where I was actually being paid to go to colleges and talk about zombies, talk about what I love. And I was so excited. And I told my professor this, and the first thing he said was, oh, God, I sure hope we don't pay you to come here. <laughs> and that was great, because it was a great lesson. Just like hurting myself during ROTC, getting fired from SNL, and all those years of rejection, they were all amazing lessons that I learned to put in the pages of my life survival guide. And one of the most important lessons I learned was not to be afraid of being afraid. And I know you think I'm just ripping off FDR. No. Um, I, I learned that it's not enough to just be scared of challenging things that are scary. It's to conquer the fear of the actual feeling of fear because it is the most primal feeling we have. It is encoded in our DNA. It's our survival mechanism. And it stopped so many people from doing what they want. And it stopped me for so long because I just didn't want to feel afraid. I didn't want to feel small and helpless. And, and you know that first feeling you had at seventh grade? Like, I didn't want to feel that ever again. So for a while, I didn't do all the things I wanted to do until I learned to flip it. And I learned to make that feeling of fear my lighthouse because I realized if I was doing something that scared me, I was doing something that mattered to me, something that was important, a challenge that even if I didn't succeed, I would be stronger and smarter coming out of it than when I went in. And I learned from experience that even if I hadn't done that, if I had tried to do the sort of safe, comfortable color within the lines path, it don't exist. It can exist, not for your whole life. The new resource students will tell you that. And I know some of you are new resource students, what? Okay. Oh, good, you know who they are. Good, good, good. I thought I was going to have to explain. They're the old people. <laughs> no, when, I, when I graduated, when I went here, we had new resource students, and they were all talking about, like, the 70s and 8-tracks and David Cassidy. And, <laughs> you know, like old stuff. And the sad thing is they're probably all my age now. And they're probably all talking about, like, Seinfeld and dial-up internet. <laughs> New resource students, what's up? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but they'll tell you that at some point in your life, adversity is going to come banging down your door. And better to prepare for it now when you don't have kids and a family and all these responsibilities that make decisions for you. It's better to prepare when you're fired in your 20s than to get downsized in your 50s. That's what they would tell me, and that's what my friends tell me now. My friends who are out in the workforce and who struggled and accomplished and are now dealing with 20-somethings who they say are just made of glass. Not you, Steve. Um, it's a <laughs> metaphor. They say they're dealing with these 20-somethings who are just, they won't take criticism, and they can't take risks. They think because they had 500 Facebook friends and they had some decent grades that the world's just going to fall into their lap. And they're so devastated when it doesn't. And then they're so terrified to fail. And I'm not saying that's you. Look, once again, I don't know who you are. I don't even know if this is real. 
all right? In my narcissism, they, this may just be one big episode of Punked. Ashton Kutcher's gonna jump out from behind a bush and be like, hey, Brooksy, nobody cares what you have to say, suck it. <laughs> and he may be right. Because like I said, this is just what I've learned in my experiences. And what I've learned is people can pretty much be broken down into two categories. The ones who go out there and chase their dreams and struggle and risk and win sometimes and lose sometimes and learn how to live. That group is alive. And then there's the group that ain't. Oh, thank you. Yeah, they're the ones that lived. You know what I'm talking about. The parents, the people who paid for all this. You know that some of them went out there and lived, but you also, some of them didn't, right? Some of them went out there, no thank you, too hard. Some of those people graduated with me and they were so much smarter than me, so much more talented than me. They should be standing here. Oh, by the way, did I mention I'm dyslexic? <laughs> yeah, painfully. A horribly dyslexic kid who grew up to be a professional writer. Go figure. <laughs> but some of these friends who graduated with me they could have had these wonderful, exciting, enriching lives. And not only did they give up on their dreams, what broke my heart was some of them wouldn't even figure out what their dreams were because they didn't want to have to go for it because it was just too scary. And instead, they just grabbed whatever little bones of security or false sense of security was thrown to them. It's like, ah, good, false sense of security. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this. Look, they tell you, you know, write what you know. Well, I'm talking about what I know and what I've seen in my limited experience out there is that there are two groups of people, the riskers and the living death. And that life pretty much is actually just one big game of humans versus zombies. Thank you.